So you probably all know Go. Um, Go is a programming language, and it was created in 2008 at Google. Um, and it was created to uh, solve problems at Google's kind of scale. And what do I mean by Google scale? I mean scale in terms of running on clusters of thousands of machines in dozens of data centers around the world. But I also mean this kind of scale. This is from the 2008 annual report of Google, and we had more than 7,000 people in research and development. That's engineering. Um, and today we have almost twice that number, so that's huge teams of programmers working on massive uh, code bases of you know, millions of lines of code. So what are the important factors at scale? Well, first of all, we need speed, both in terms of development speed um, and also in terms of execution speed, efficiency. Um, second is reliability. You need code that does what you expect it does. And the third is simplicity. Um, at scale, you really need to fight this kind of systemic complexity that can really weigh you down um, in the long term. So in 2008, we were kind of locked in this deadly embrace, uh, at Google anyway, with C++ and Java and Python. Um, and on the C++ side, we had a lot of speed. Um, but to write C++ code reliably is very difficult. And obviously, it's not simple. It's actually an incredibly complex language. Um, on the, with Java, we had uh, a language that was um, still quite efficient um, and easier to write correctly and quite reliable, but it suffers from this massive systemic overcomplexity. Um, and with Python, we had a language that developers loved using. It's a highly productive language, um, but it's quite inefficient at runtime, and also um, its kind of absence of a type system, or rather an invisible type system, um, can lead to some sort of problems. So um, when Go was created, uh, we just tr tried to address the gap between uh, these kind of three technologies that we were so accustomed to at the time. But it turns out that what works at scale also helps in the small, in teams of smaller people, um, and also just individuals like myself. So what I want to talk about today are the five things that I love about Go, me personally. Um, and you know, I understand probably most of you here have already written some Go code, some of, some of you professionally, um, and so you can just kind of cheer along if, uh, if you agree. So the first thing that I love are interfaces. Um, Go interfaces are small. So this is a, you know, the canonical um, Go interface, the stringer interface. They usually have one or fewer methods, and this kind of smallness um, is great for flexibility, and they're easy to understand, and they're easy to implement. Um, interfaces are satisfied implicitly. This point type is a stringer simply because it implements the string method. And importantly, interfaces are composable. They encourage composability. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you take like the reader and writer interfaces, the streams of binary data um, in Go, we have all these different implementations, uh, you know, network connections, files, compressors, decompressors, and so on. And so in this program here, um, I have a gzip reader that reads from standard input, and then I copy the unzipped standard input to standard output. So it's just an implementation of gunzip. But what we're seeing here is the composition of these three different interfaces and the connection with these connector functions like IO copy. Another example of some code I wrote earlier today, I needed to enclose some XML with a, a element, a top element, before I could decode it. And I was able to use multi-reader to compose two string readers and a byte reader together to form just one stream of XML data. And it's interesting to note that for all of the utility in those I.O. packages, um, they actually weren't designed from day one. The, the uh, OS package already existed before the I.O. package came along. And the I.O. package only sort of came into existence after we'd implemented um, the bytes package with its buffer type. And we saw the sort of commonality between uh, the, the two implementations. And so what that means is that interfaces kind of capture behavior that emerges in your programs and often are declared after the fact. And finally, interfaces are key. Um, they're the tool for abstracting uh, functionality in Go. You know, there's no generics, no classes, no inheritance. And so uh, once you understand how interfaces work, you understand how Go's type system works. And that's a tremendous benefit for readability and simplicity. But why do I love interfaces? Basically, interfaces just help me write good code quickly. I can just write the code uh, 
that's in my head to solve the problem that I have. And then after the fact, I can see the patterns that emerge in my code and use interfaces to abstract and generalize my code. And the really nice thing about it is the whole time I still have type safety. So I'm, I, I came from a dynamic language kind of background. And um, I used to do this you know, in Python or JavaScript. And, um, but without the type safety, I never felt like I, I could safely refactor things. I never felt like I could really dive in there and make changes. And so um, with Go's type safety and interfaces, I, I'm able to do that without fear and get a lot more work done. So the second thing that I love, probably predictably, is um, concurrency, Go's concurrency model, to be exact. So everyone knows uh, Go routines are the basis of concurrent execution in Go. You put a Go st uh, keyword in front of a function call. That function call runs in a new Go routine. Channels are the second piece of Go's concurrency puzzle. Um, and they express, importantly, communication and synchronization. Um, and so, you know, in this example, we have a Go routine that's generating numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, and the main Go routine is consuming those, but they're kept in lockstep by the synchronous nature of channels. The send only proceeds when the receiving side is ready. This is a really powerful construct for expressing something that's difficult to achieve in other environments. And finally, the third piece is a select statement, um, which enables you to compute on channel operations. So, you know, if I wanted to add the ability to shut down that Fibonacci uh, uh, loop, I can just add a quit channel and send a quit message. And then in the main loop of the Fibonacci, we have this select statement which, which muxes on those channel operations. And um, the really nice thing about this is most concurrent Go programs have some select statement like this at their heart. Um, and so it's a really nice and natural way of expressing uh, what's actually a kind of difficult concept. Um, I'd love to talk more about concurrency at length, um, but if you're more interested, you should definitely check out one of these or both of these two talks. But why do I love Go's concurrency model? Basically, it just feels natural to me to, to use Go's concurrency features. You know, if I have some code that's, that's like this, it does something, something else, and so on, and I realize that the second and third things can be done concurrently, um, I can just add some channels and some Go routines, and suddenly I have concurrency, and it just works. And the reason this works is that the concurrency model is, is always there in the background, and so it's there when you need it, but it doesn't force you to write code um, in a particular style. You don't need to break your code up into these sets of callbacks. Um, you don't need to manage thread pools and so on. You don't need to keep all this stuff in the back of your mind um, if you're not thinking about concurrency. But when you do decide to think about concurrency, the tools are all there and you can use them straight away. The third thing that I love about workspaces, about Go, is workspaces. So a workspace is where you keep your Go code. It's also where you keep everyone else's Go code. And so uh, you nominate the location of your workspace with the Go path environment variable um, in that directory. Um, you have a source bin and package directories that contain source code, binary executables, and intermediate library build artifacts, respectively. And here's a really small Go path that contains just a single repository from the Go examples repository on GitHub. Um, and it contains two packages, the hello package, which is a command executable, and the string util package, which is a library. Um, if we take a look at the uh, hello.go file, we can see that it imports the string util package by its full path, and it uses that, uh, the reverse function from the string util package um, to reverse the string. Um, and it's interesting to note that the import path is actually the full qualified name of that, uh, of that package inside the, the workspace. And so if I go into the hello directory and run go install, it uh, builds and links both the string util package and the hello binary and installs it to the workspace's bin directory so I can execute it. And so now the workspace looks something like this. And that string util.a file can be used you know, as a, if for incremental builds and so on. Um, the Go tool is also responsible for doing things like running tests and also fetching remote dependencies. And because we use the, uh, the full repository address for um, the base of the import path, the Go tool can just resolve, 
dependencies across the internet from anywhere, which is a really convenient thing. This is an audio synthesizer that I wrote that uses a few external packages, and that's what gets pulled in when you run go.get. Um, there's a lot more to be said about workspaces, particularly surrounding uh, dependency management and reproducible builds, and I encourage you to check out um, either of these uh, pieces from conferences this year. Um, also, I believe uh, Keith Rarick uh, pretty shortly is going to give a talk on a similar topic. But if I have one thing to say about workspaces, a piece of advice, GoPath should be set to your home directory. I mean, you don't have to, obviously, but that's, that's, that's what I do. And uh, having a bin directory in your home directory where all your Go executables are is, is really convenient. But why do I love workspaces? Um, first of all, not having any make files or build XML files or any of these kind of like build manifests um, to keep in sync with my code is huge for productivity. Um, I don't have to remember the syntax of make files, which I even, I guess, two decades of using make files, I still can't remember exactly how they work because I would change them so seldom every time I need to do something complex, I would have to refresh my memory about how it works. Um, and, uh, and so I know that if I just write my Go code and the Go code is correct, then the build system knows how to build my Go code. And that's, that's huge for, for productivity. Secondly, everyone already knows how to use workspaces. Like we all know how a file system works, I hope. And uh, we all know how our VCSs work, I guess. Um, but the thing is, uh, the, Go, the Go tool and workspaces just takes those two things and lets them do their job while the Go tool just handles building. Third, I love workspaces because they enable great tools. So um, you've probably all seen godoc.org, um, a site that will fetch documentation from arbitrary repositories on the internet. So if you looked at the docs for the string util package at godoc.org, that's what you would see. And this has just been, I think, vital to uh, the Go community and the Go ecosystem in terms of visibility of Go packages and also encouraging people to write documentation. And I think anything that encourages people to document their code has got to be a huge benefit. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the kind of tooling that workspaces enable. And I'll talk about something more later. The fourth thing I love is GoFumpt. Um, GoFumpt is the, the pretty printer for Go source code. Um, and so it takes code that looks like this, and turns it into that. Um, and, you know, why do I love GoFumpt? I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? But first of all, it ends formatting wars. So raise your hand if you've ever had an argument with a colleague about the position of a brace or a semicolon. For the video, every single person in the audience is raising their hand right now. Was it worth it, though? No. Yes? Get out. Um, so simply ending the formatting wars is huge for productivity. You should never be having an argument with someone about white space. It's insane. Um, secondly, most code is, is in GoFumpt form. Um, I, a couple of years ago, I downloaded all of the Go source code, the open source Go source code on the internet um, and analyzed it, and I found that uh, at least 80% of it was in the GoFumpt standard form. Um, I think that, num that proportion is probably higher today. Um, and interestingly, the, whether it was GoFumpted or not was a signal about the quality of the code as well. Like I, I would look at the code that wasn't GoFumpted and it tended to be kind of bad. So for all intents and purposes, you can just assume that all Go code that you want to use is in GoFumpt style. Um, and this enables mechanical source manipulation. So the type of... Um, the, the packages that GoFumpt is built with are these Go parser, Go printer, Go AST packages in the standard library. Um, and those packages can be used not just for reformatting Go source code, but also for manipulating Go source code mechanically. And um, so uh, those of you who used Go around the time of Go1, you might remember GoFix. Um, when we released Go1 in 2012, we made changes to the, the language and the standard libraries, um, quite wide sweeping changes. Um, but we knew that you know, we had this huge community to, to support, both in the open source world and also inside Google. And so when we migrated to Go1, we provided this tool, GoFix, that was backed by the same technology of GoFumpt. And 
on the day that Go1 was released, you could just run Go fix on your code and it would automatically update like 99% of the things you needed to do to update to Go1. And this was huge because it just obviated the entire need for dealing with versioning. It was like, if you're not using Go1, you should just run Go fix and then you're using Go1. Um, and also, because the code was in Go Fund style already, um, any of the Go fixes changes in the diffs were purely semantic. There were no white space changes. And so that's, that's of critical importance. Um, since then, uh, a lot more um, static analysis tools have been developed for Go for analyzing Go source code and uh, how it executes and what its types are and so on. And so now we have this package, uh, this command rather, um, called Go rename, which is a type aware um, renaming tool for Go source. And so these two lines would rename the JSON marshal and unmarshal functions to encode and decode. Um, but because it's type aware and because it's workspace aware, um, it will actually rename those, those uh, types across, um, not just in the JSON package, but also in all of your packages that use those packages in your workspace. And so this, you should check it out. Um, it's available in the GoTools repository. And um, there's a lot more tooling besides that all this stuff enables. For instance, my fifth and final love, which is Go Imports. Who here uses Go Imports, actually? Awesome, so about half. Um, so Go, Go Imports is basically GoFund that is aware of workspaces. Um, and so it'll take code like this. This is just a simple program that uh, return, that prints the SHA-3 hash of the standard input. And so if I have this in my editor and I have Go Imports on my on save hook, when I hit save, it goes from this to that, right? And so um, it's written basically half the program for me, all of those import statements. And, then, and um, so what do I love about Go Imports? Well, isn't it obvious? I just showed you. It took that <laughs> and turned it into that. But it's not just the first time you hit save. It's also as you keep working. Um, it's constantly adding and removing dependencies depending on what your code is actually doing. And so this really increases the velocity with which I can get things done in Go. Also, Go is fastidious about enforcing um, the usage of packages that you import. If you import a package log um, and then you don't use it, you get a compile error like this. But thanks to Go imports, I haven't seen that error message in a really long time. And I'm, you know, I don't regret it. Um, or I don't miss it, rather. So um, I just thought I'd sort of trying to finish with a story. Like a few um, months ago, I was working at work. <laughs> it's a good place to do it. And um, I was sending gophers, which I guess all of you have one of right now. Yay. <laughs> and um, I was sending them to each of the people at Google who have committed Go code inside Google. And um, to do that, I needed to make a query against our um, code search engine to find all the authors of Go code. And then I needed to query our organization store to find the employee records and the desk locations of all of the Googlers around the world who'd committed Go code. And so, you know, I wrote my little Go program. I was, you know, using the, the various um, protocol buffers to access the services, making some requests in parallel using some Go routines and channels. And um, you know, I wrote this kind of 20 lines of, of code to access these services and print out the, the sorted list of desk numbers. And then when I hit save, Go imports word into action. And we have a version of Go imports internal to Google that uses, that can access our entire corpus of Go code inside Google. And um, it populated like this 15 lines of import statements. And because this is Google, everything is bigger and more complicated than it needs to be. And so the... Uh, <laughs> The import statements were sometimes like 60 characters plus, you know, and this was all stuff that I didn't need to write. And in fact, I didn't even need to think about. And like when I hit save and I saw that appear, I just kind of like, it, it crystallized, you know, something that I felt about Go for a long time, which is that, you know, Go is much more than just a language. Like the language is just a nice solid basis um, for, uh, for constructing this ecosystem that we've built on top of it. You know, we have these great standard libraries and like those IO packages and so on. And then all of the third party packages built on top of that. And now we have all these tooling. And you know, as we write more tools, we're just building all this software to help us write software. And the computers are doing all the hard stuff. 
and like all that's left for us to do is focus on the problem. You know, the language doesn't even let me kind of over abstract things, it just encourages me to just get the work done. And so, you know, when I hit save, I just thought, you know, I love this world that we've created and I never want to leave. So I hope you join me. Thank you.